We're in the book of Esther. Everybody say Esther. That's right. It's an interesting, awesome book in the Bible. And there's a lot of stuff that takes place in Esther. In fact, there is a tradition called Purim that uh, the Jews still do today, which we're going to explain in our A2C, in the final A2C group during this series, because this series is going to take us all the way through that. So there's a, there's a tradition called Purim that the Jews still do today that actually came from the book of Esther. So a lot goes on in the book of Esther. But before we get into today's message, I'm going to tell this story really quickly so that I ain't got to tell it 99 times. Um, I cut my finger. Some of you have seen it on Facebook. I was deep sea fishing, and basically I caught a big kingfish. And they say that if you whack them in the head, they'll go limp and stop moving around because these fish are big and they got jaws like sharks do. And I went to do that, and the first time was fine. The second time, he must have reacted, and my finger must have. I don't even know what happened, honestly, but my finger must have went across his teeth, and his teeth are like jaws. I mean, just like like a saw almost. Anyway, sliced my finger wide open, eight stitches, went into the emergency room, got it taken care of. I'm good. Might have to go look at a tendon later on. But other than that, that's what happened. Can we continue? All right. So get that out of the way. Um, Other than that, the book of Esther is awesome. Last week, we did something that was a little different. We started in kind of chapter 2, and we learned about a guy named Mordecai. And Mordecai was Esther's uncle who was raising her. Esther, her parents died, and so she was an orphan. And Esther was being raised by her uncle Mordecai. We looked at this, uh, basically what took place last week and we said you know regardless of kind of what Esther was doing at this time in the Bible Mordecai would have still made this guy Haman mad and this guy Haman came up with a plot not only to to kill Mordecai but to kill all the Jews to wipe out all the Jews in Persia almost like a Hitler type annihilation and the whole book of Esther is about how this young, beautiful girl had this opportunity to be a part of this beauty pageant, if you will, and the prize was to become queen the, of, of King Xerxes. She actually won it, and because of her influence with the king, because the king was so enamored by Esther, she used her influence with the king to save, and not only save, but if you read the story, it's quite interesting, the Jews were allowed to defend themselves And they actually killed tons of people because of the influence that Esther had with King Xerxes. And so just goes to show you that God kind of puts you in certain places in your life and that you have moments where you can leverage the influence that God has given you to do certain things and to do good things that benefit people because God always uses uh, you to do good things things. But we're going to continue on with this uh, this series today. We're going to specifically look now at the, the, the things that Esther went through during this process of becoming the queen. As we know from last week, uh, King Xerxes was drunk one day during this party that he threw that lasted 108 days and then he threw another party for the normal people that lasted seven days and on the seventh day he was what the bible called in high spirits in other words he was drunk and he wanted to show off his queen and and some of us guys you know like "Ah, look at check out my wife you know she's hot you know we believe that well that was the king was doing the same thing you know he wanted to show off his queen queen vashti and he actually called for her. She refused to come. And the king sought advice and was like, listen, we can't let this become a normal thing for women to do. And those days, it was a total different time, total different culture and everything. We can't let this become a normal thing. So they basically deposed King Vashti and, and banished her out of King Xerxes' presence forever. And then King Xerxes one day in the beginning of chapter 2 began to miss the queen. A lot of scholars believe that this was actually four years after 
that there's actually a four-year gap between chapter 1 and chapter 2. And there was a lot of time and some wars that were fought and everything else. And the king began to miss his queen. So he sought out advice from some of his people that he trusted. And this is kind of where we're going to pick up in chapter 2, verses 2 through 4. So his personal attendants suggested, this was their uh, suggestions. Let us search the, the, the empire to find beautiful young virgins for the queen, for the king. Let the king appoint agents to each providence to bring these beautiful young women into the royal harem at the fortress of Susa. Haggai, the king's eunuch, in charge of the harem, will see that they're given all the beauty treatments. And after that, the young women who most pleases the king will be made queen. The woman who most pleases the, the king will be made queen instead of Vashti. The advice was very appealing. Everybody say appealing. What advice like that to a king wouldn't be appealing? The advice was very appealing to the king. Just look at what's going on here. Let's bring in all these women that you can... I'll censor myself. And then let's just do this big giant thing where you can test them all out. I mean, that sounds good to any man king. That's what they're saying. So he put the plan in effect. So I want to talk to you about taking advice really quick. All right. So my boy dog, Max is uh is actually feeling good now but he we just recovered he just recovered from a back injury and he's a he's a Dotson so Dotson's it's pretty typical for Dotson to have a back injury but I, we didn't know it was a back injury because this dog that is normally just jumping off the couch and bouncing off the walls because he has so much energy had a hard time one day when I come home from work just getting up the step to the back door. Just getting up that little threshold there, that little step, had a really hard time with it. And I was like, man, something is wrong with Max. And I called Melanie, and I said, did you notice anything this morning wrong with, with Max? He, you know, he had a hard time getting up the step. And she said, yes, I was just hoping that you know, it would be okay by the time he got home. Well, it wasn't. So immediately, I didn't even get all the stuff done that I needed to get, get done for work. Immediately, I grabbed Max up. I called a vet. One vet couldn't fit us in. The other one over here in Willis could fit us in. So immediately, I grabbed him up, and it was a little scary because he was, when you felt him, his whole stomach, abdomen area was very tight, and he was kind of shaking. And we know from previous experiences with Molly, our other Dotson, that a lot of times when they're in pain, they shake like that. It's just a natural reaction. And, and so I, it just wasn't good. So we packed him up. I took him to the vet. Long story short, they diagnosed him with pancreatitis and gave us some medications, sent him home. It was really kind of strange because he began to feel better about two days later when we were in Galveston and our parents were taking care of the dog uh, or taking care of Max. By the time we got back from Galveston, he was feeling pretty good. But then the very next day, it was like he was the other time before. He was still in pain, still shaking, still had a hard time moving his back legs. I mean, literally, he would just, it would have, his back legs were being affected by what was going on. And it was, it was quite scary, man, this dog that's normally so healthy. So we took him back to the vet, and they gave us some more advice. And they said, well, we think it's his back, this and that. They did some other stuff. They gave us some other medication. Didn't work. Anyway, Saturday, the very like next day, he still wasn't feeling good. We took him back. Third visit, $1,200 later. Uh, they still think it's his back. They took some x-rays. They did this. They did that. A couple of days went by. The weekend went by. He just was not getting better, man. It seemed like he was actually getting worse. And at that time, we were like, we need a second opinion. So we actually called Tender Paws, which is literally right around the corner from us, where I tried to get him in first, and we, they made room for us. We got him in there. She did a bunch of stuff that the other doctors didn't do. Great veterinarian. Dr. Ree is awesome. I highly recommend her. 
Then she said, it is his back, but here's the deal. We've got to get him a cage. We've got to put him on bed rest. We've got to do this and this, this and this, this and that. So the advice from one doctor was different than the advice from the other doctor. And it really matters a lot of times what advice you get. And actually, it matters a lot of different ways. So I, I want to give you these points because obviously the king in this scenario, the advice was appealing to him. So there's times when we go through, through stuff in life, and it may be business issues, it may be choices that we're dealing with, or whatever, maybe big choices that we're dealing with in life, and we seek out advice from other people. And so I want to give you a couple things that will help you with this. So I said, when listening to advice, we should ask, number one, who is the source? Who's the source that you're getting advice from? Do you trust the, assor- the source? Does it ha- is it somebody with experience? Um, we must be behind on these slides, but is it somebody with experience? Uh, one of the things, obviously, when, when, you go, <laughs> when you go to a doctor, it is the only time that you want the brutal truth. You don't want the doctor to tell you something that's appealing you want the doctor to say, here's the deal. You need this, this, and this. But a lot of times when we go through life, we, we seek after, man, that's hard to read. Can we change that text, Josh, or something? We seek after advice just so that we could get our ears tickled a little bit at times. There's times where we, we seek after advice from friends just to have somebody else that's on our side that we agree with. And not necessarily is that great advice. It may be like this advice. It may be appealing. But it's not necessarily the greatest advice. And so when we're seeking that advice, who is the source? Can we trust them? Do they have experience? And do they have your best, your interest at heart? Number two, is the advice good? Because a lot of times we get somebody that tells you, oh, they did that. Well, what you need to do, you need to go and you need to do this and this. And you need to tell them and this and that. And necessarily, that's not good advice. It may be something that you want to do, but it may not be great advice. So is the advice good? Um, is it, does it, would God approve of the advice? And number three, does it help the big picture or does it just put a Band-Aid on the circumstance? Does it help the big picture or does it put a band-aid on the circumstance? Because a lot of times when we deal with things in life, we have to ask ourselves, are we just fixing it for the moment or are we trying to solve the underlying issue that's going on? And a lot of times we may take advice from somebody that just kind of puts a band-aid on the circumstance. Listen, when I went in and cut my finger, I didn't want a Band-Aid. I had those on the boat. I wanted stitches. I wanted it to heal up, and I wanted to know if I cut my tendon in there or my whatever it is in there because I could barely move the top of my finger. If I did, then I wanted you to tell me that. I don't want you to, you know, oh, it doesn't look too bad and just stitch it up and send me on my way. Sometimes advice is hard to take, but sometimes it's what you need to hear. And it really matters who you ask for advice. So let's go on. Now we read, we, we, we read that Esther has more, uh, in, this, in this scenario, we read that Esther has more than just good looks. She also has personality. Esther 2, 8 through 9. As a result of the king's decree, the, the, the decree uh, that basically said, we're going to assign people in all the providences to, to round up all the young, beautiful virgins and bring them to the king. Uh, because of that decree, Esther, along with many other young women, was brought to the king's harem at the fortress of Susa and placed in Haggai's care. Haggai was over the harem. Number nine, um, I want to go ahead and say this. The harem is like a, is like a whorehouse, okay? So if you don't know what that is, that's the type of culture that is going on here. So uh, it makes it sound good, you know, harem, whatever. But this is really what's happening, you know. So Haggai was very impressed 
with Esther and treated her kindly, okay? He quickly ordered a special menu for her and provided her with beauty treatments. Beauty treatments here is an under, you're going to see that these aren't just natural beauty treatments. I want to elaborate on these here in a minute that are, that are pretty elaborate. That are, um, he also assigned her seven maids, uh, specially chosen from the king's palace, and he moved her and her maids into the best place in the harem. So listen, if you had to go to this kind of place, at least Esther had the best treatment here in this kind of uh, situation. And so as you can tell that it wasn't just necessarily her good looks. Haggai was impressed with her. He was, must have been impressed with her personality because if you round up all the beautiful women from all the different providences, there's going to be a ton of beautiful women there at this one event. You know, there's going to be many there. So there was something unique about Esther that kind of separated her from all the other ladies and what it is is basically the favor of god that was on her life and she probably was more reserved than all the other women that were there and she was obviously very beautiful but she also was a jew and the jews were unique because they were god's people so she had god's favor on her life and even though she was sometimes in the craziest circumstances in the middle of this harem amongst all these other women Haggai, the guy that was over it recognized that she, there was something different about her and treated her with favor in, in this weird turn of events esther was treated with incredible favor and moved to a certain room where she was given special foods, special maids, and special care that all the other women weren't getting. And I'm telling you guys, in your life, here's the deal. If you're a believer and you believe in God and you follow his will and you try to be obedient as best as you can and you seek God's will for your life, man, Never underestimate the favor of God in what you pursue. Never underestimate the favor. And I, I kind of reworded it. Never underestimate what you pre pursue because of the favor of God. Here's the deal. I don't deserve to, to be in the job that I'm in right now. I had no experience going into it, anything like that. But because of the favor of God in my life, I knew somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody, all right? And it's because all those know, know somebodies were actually Christian people. Somebody pulled some strings and got me in the job that, I was, that I'm in right now. And it's a great job, and it provides well for my family. But the truth is, is that I could have said, well, I don't know anything about that job. I'm not going to pursue it. But I didn't allow my own experience or even my own knowledge to stop me from pursuing something because I knew that if it was the Lord's will, God would work out his favor and make it happen. And it did. And there's a lot of times where God shuts doors where you pursue things that ought to be left shut. But on the other hand, there are, I wrote it like this, your human qualifications can open doors, but the favor of God opens locked doors. So there are certain doors that maybe you don't, you're scared to pursue. But let me tell you something. The favor of God is pretty incredible. And it will work out things in your life better than you could ever have imagined. So don't necessarily let your qualifications be the judge of what you pursue in life. Because God's favor will work incredible circumstances in your life. So don't underestimate God's favor. Obviously, Esther is in one of the craziest circumstances, but yet is being treated almost like she's a queen. So let's continue this story. Now uh, Now that we've heard uh, everything else, let's look at these beauty treatments because, listen, I've heard of women going to get a manicure and a pedicure and all those things, and I hate to admit it, I've got a pedicure. Is, pedicure is the feet, right? Yeah. Okay, so... I hate to admit it, but one one week and at one moment of weakness, um, when Melanie and I were on a short little weekend vacation, she was like, "Hey, let's go get a mani and pedicure." And I was like, "We didn't have our son with us, and no other guys." So 
I was like, all right, cool. So let's do it, you know. And we went in there, and they this it's actually pretty cool. They massage your feet, and they take off the the what are those things called? Calyx and everything else, and what? Calluses. Calluses. Calluses? No, the things that are around your nail. Cuticles. See, that's what I'm talking about. They remove the cuticles and everything else, and they they. <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about. I've only done it once, dead gummit. So, but it felt great, man. It was like sitting there, and they you you don't just sit in the chair like this, brother. I'm not suggesting any man go get this done. All I'm saying is, it's pretty awesome. So, so you sit in a chair that has these like things that go like on your back and everything. So I'm taking up too much time on this, but. It's actually pretty cool, but I, I've heard of women, you know, getting beauty treatments, you know, and, and a lot of women wake up, you know, an hour earlier than men do because they've got to do all this other stuff to them that men, but this takes it to a whole nother level, my friends. Read this, chapter two, verses 12 through 13. Before each young woman was taken to the king's bed, she was given the prescribed 12 months of beauty treatments, six months with oil and myrrh, followed by six months with special perfumes and ointments. And when it was time for her to go to the king's place, she was given her choice of whatever clothing or jewelry she wanted to take from the harem. So probably the other women were given certain things to put on but Esther actually had her choice of jewelry and whatever, wigs, I mean, whatever you wanted to do, dresses, just, you could just, your mind could just go crazy about all the different things that was at that harem that, that she could have used, okay? But she was given the choice. And let me tell you something, just because you have options doesn't mean you should explore them, all right? There are times in life where we have many different options, but just because you have options doesn't mean you should explore options. In fact, some options are simply a distraction from what is ne needed or necessary. In other words, I, I, I say it like this, don't try to fix what's not broken. A lot of times in life, and, and I'll tell a story to elaborate on this, a lot of times in life we, we go out of the way to try to be good at something that we're not necessarily good at. A lot of times in life, we, we try to become someone we're not. And the, the rack on our grocery stores are filled with magazines of women that are photoshopped and all these other things. And that may not be who God made you to be. But in this case... Esther was, was beautiful. And here's the deal. She didn't need a lot of stuff to make her even more beautiful. And a lot of times in life, you have to be comfortable with what God has made you to be. And in other words, you need to become comfortable with who God created you to be. And stop trying to be like other people. God made you unique. He handcrafted you in your mama's womb. And he made you who you are. Now listen, we can make improvements. There's a lot of things that we can do where we can, we can improve. I'm not against makeup and all the other stuff. Lord knows that. But we can make improvements. But let me just tell a story. We're at a weird spot in our life where I'm going on 39. My wife's 42, which is crazy can't believe that I'm almost 40 and that she is 42. It's to me that's just mind-boggling when we were just in our 20s yesterday. So so we're not, you know, spring chickens anymore, but we're at a weird point in our life where most of our friends are going off on cruises and everything else. They've already raised their kids and they're doing their thing. And because we had such a late time in life, 
we're just now starting raising. And I have to be honest, like there's times where I'm like, man, I'm a little jealous because Melanie doesn't want to take Blaze, you know, anywhere. And she definitely doesn't want to leave him for five days. All right, the kids are going to come in. They're getting ready for their, but I'm not done yet, so listen up. And the, and the truth is, is there, there, can be t- there can be moments in your life where you look at somebody else's, else's life and you envy that person for what they have or what they can do or whatever. And I, I'm guilty of this. I'm, I'm, at times, because of where we are, it doesn't fit where other people are. But the truth is, is that what a unique experience that we get to do with, with going like we did just a week ago to the beach with Blaze and making memories of our own. And sometimes if we aren't careful, we can get so wrapped up in somebody else's life that we forget to really live our own life. And God has given each of you a unique life and everything else. So learn to cherish the life that you have. Be comfortable with who you are and just live your life for what it is. Stop trying to be somebody else god hasn't created you to be that person so look at what esther did as we conclude in verses 15 through 17 it says esther was the daughter of abadal who was mordecai's uncle mordecai had adopted his young younger cousin esther and listen to this when it was esther's turn to go to the king when a year had gone by of beauty treatments that she didn't really need when it was Esther's time to go to the king, she accepted the advice of Haggai, the, the eunuch, in charge of the harem. She asked for nothing except what he suggested. Now, she took his advice, but she, I like how it words it here. She asked for nothing except what he suggested. And she was admired by everyone who saw her. Esther was already beautiful. She didn't need a bunch of stuff to put on to make her more beautiful. And it was because of her God-given beauty that made her appealing to not only... Imagine if you're in this scenario and all the other women are grabbing all this other stuff and Esther is only grabbing the small things that the guy in charge is suggesting. Everybody else is putting on a front. And Esther looks natural. 16, Esther was taken to the King Xerxes at the royal palace in early winter of the seventh year of his reign. And the king loved Esther more than all the other young women. He was so delighted with her that he set the royal crown over her head and declared her queen instead of Vashti. I'm going to be going through these quickly, but these are all going to come up. God has made you unique and given you personality that nobody has. This doesn't mean that we can't let people give us sound advice or even make a few adjustments. Ultimately, we have to realize that God is with us and that He can make a way where, where other people fail. We must also be true to who we are and be happy with what we have conforming to what is popular or good for someone else can often lead to depression and unhappiness which our society deals with in rapid numbers our society is so wrapped up in trying to be people that we're not that we have people in in record numbers today that are taking depression medication because they're unhappy. Your pursuit of happiness begins with understanding that God created you and is maintained by, con- by being comfortable with who you are and what you have. Our pursuit of happiness begins with just recognizing the fact that God had a little bit to do or a lot to do with who we are and maintained by just being happy with who we are and what we have. Esther was obviously beautiful. She didn't need a bunch of stuff. She went to the king 
And there was something unique about her. Obviously, it was the favor of God that got her through the door. But her beauty and also the favor of God and the fact that she was different from all the other women who was trying to be somebody that they weren't was really the unique factor that set her apart from all these thousands, I'm sure, of other women. So I'm going to pray. We're going to let the kids come up. They got a quick little skit. So I just want to challenge you guys today. No matter what you're going through, no matter where you're at in life, you know what? Don't look at somebody else's life and envy what they have and envy what they can do and you can't do and everything else. People spend so much time envying other people that they forget to live that the life they have and the life God give, has given you. Learn to just experience the joy of being alive. I, I love my life. I love my son. I love my wife. I love the fact that I get to go fishing. I, I, I get to do a lot. And, and at times it's stupid that I can look at somebody else and go, man, I wish I, wish I had a little bit of what they had. We all do it, I think, if in, in, a, in a little bit. But the truth is, is that if we just learn to enjoy our own life, you'd find that we wouldn't be unhappy anymore. We'd live out the life that God has planned for us. Father God, we thank you for this time. I pray that this was a message that spoke to somebody through the book of Esther. And, and although that Esther had beauty going on for, for her, a lot of us have other things going on for us. A lot of us have personality, charisma. Some of us have brains that are just super smart and can figure out things some of us are witty, and we can banter back and forth and connect with people. A lot of us have a lot of different things that we have going on. A lot of us have great families that are close by that we get to connect with all the time. Friends and everything else. Father, I pray that you would put it in us to be happy with what, where we're at, what we've got, and the life that you've given us. I pray that we would begin to enjoy this life like, like no other time or no other period in our life where we can just look and notice your favor in every aspect of our life. Notice your favor at our job. Notice your favor in the relationships that we have. Notice, our, notice your favor in the small things, in the, in the home that we live in, the fact that we have shelter over our head, clothes on our back, and learn to just be happy with even the small things. I pray, God, that we would find happiness in this life and find happiness in the joy that you've given us. And that joy is that peace that we have in our soul. That even when we go through tough times, it is well with our soul. Father, I pray all of this, and I pray your hand of protection be upon every one of these people that are here today. Encourage us through this message. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.